All right, so if you're just joining us, we're going through the Gospels, looking at the life of Jesus, and I am really excited about what I, I believe uh, this will do for us, do in us. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Apostle Paul says, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul says, even looking at Jesus dimly has this transforming effect on us. The glory, the beauty of this man affects change in our hearts. So let's just, before we even begin today, let's just ask God to do that in us today as we just look at the, the beauty of, uh, of, of Christ. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you that Jesus became one of us so that we could see your beauty, so we could know your love in a, in a very personal and up-close way. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who comes to live inside us, to reveal your written word to our hearts and to our minds. Holy Spirit, you were the great teacher, the great illuminator. Reveal the truth. Would you speak to us now? Illumine our minds. Awaken our thoughts with your light. Show us more of the beauty of Jesus. And I ask that in his powerful name, in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, amen. amen. All right. Today we're going to focus in on the man who, cho who God chooses to introduce his son. Jesus told a crowd one day here in Matthew 11.10. He says, this is the one about whom it was written or it is written, now I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Now they immediately knew who he was talking about and what he was quoting. It's an Old Testament passage written 400 years earlier. You might recognize it from Handel's Messiah, especially if I sang it for you, which I'll spare you that, all right? Malachi 3.1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, your promised Messiah, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom I delight. But then Jesus must have blown them away with this statement in verse 11. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now that is a shocker, because that includes the likeness of Abraham, David, and even the great and mighty Moses, you know, the miracle worker. The guy who went all Old Testament on the Egyptians. You remember that story? Turning their water to blood and raining down frogs and giant hail and worse. Parting the Red Sea, fasting 40 days, and doing another 40 back to back, you know, getting the Ten Commandments directly etched in stone from the finger of God. Putting up with a couple of million cantankerous people for 40 years in the wilderness and leading them safely to the promised land. That is quite a resume. But now here's the greater than Moses, John, living and preaching in the wilderness, looking like a wild man. His clothes are made of camel's hair. His food was locust and wild honey. That is a sick diet, if you ask me. And that's, this is the man God chose to be his messenger and introduce his son to the world. He first shows up in the Christmas story when the angel Gabriel appears to the priest named Zechariah and tells him, God heard your prayers. Your wife Elizabeth's going to have a baby. But it's a total shock at this point because now they're old, well past, you know, childbearing years. That'd like, be like an angel appearing to Deb and me, you know, saying, you're going to have another son. Really? And, and, you know, they've tried to get pregnant their entire marriage. God waits till all hope is gone, and then he does this. Have you noticed the Bible is full of these 11th hour miracles? You know, it's just like God just seems to love to pull these kind of things off, these out of nowhere kind of things. And God's already chosen his name. He wants him to call him John. In Hebrew, Yochanan, I think is the way you say it, which means Yahweh is gracious. So not only is he to be God's messenger, even his name is a message. Luke 1, 15, the angel says, he'll be great in the sight of the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, even before he is born. I just find that a fascinating statement. In the womb, he'll bring back many 
of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What a loaded statement that is. That that is just layered with plans, not only for God's messenger, but for his people Israel, for the whole world. He's saying John is going to blaze a path for Jesus in the spirit and power of the greatest prophet you, uh, you know, Israel has ever known. Elijah was another 40-day faster who literally called down fire from heaven and in a similar way preached a fiery message of repentance, calling the nation back to God. And he's letting him know that John's going to have this same kind of rugged courage. He's going to have the same laser-focused, intensely passionate commitment to God's message. So, back to the Christmas story. Now the angel Gabriel visits Mary, and her news is even more startling. She's going to be the virgin mother. I mean, this is coming out of nowhere. This has to just blow these people away. She's going to be the virgin mother of a baby she's to call Jesus, the son of the most high. In Hebrew, Jesus is the name Yeshua, which means Yahweh, the relational name for God is is salvation. So, so like John, Jesus' name is also a message. Yahweh is salvation. That's basically the, the meaning. Well, Mary hurries off to share the news with her cousin, who happens to be Zechariah's pregnant wife. And in Luke 1 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby John leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and she starts prophesying. Blessed is the child you will bear, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So there's this supernatural connection between Jesus and John, even before they're born, even before they're out of the womb. John the Baptist appears in all four Gospels, but really in three of the Gospels, his story is, is, is kind of laid out. So I thought we'd read this uh, from uh, the book that I recommended a couple of weeks ago called a Simpl a Simplified Harmony of the Gospel. This takes the four Gospels and puts them together chronologically. So you see it as one story instead of for, you know, because when you're reading through it, like I am in the one-year Bible, you know, you get through it, and then the, here we go again, and here we go again. So this just, you know, puts it all together. So you see all that's, that's going on. This is John's story woven from the, the references we have, and you see, that, see it there in your notes. All right, so here, here we go. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word, you still with me? <laughs> God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah. Zechariah had the son, all right, so John, in the wilderness, so he gets the word. John the Baptist came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough ways smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. John himself had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sin. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the ax is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowd were asking, asking him. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. 
tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they asked, asked him, teacher, what should we do? He told them, don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, what should we do? He said, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. Let's break this down, all right? Here we go. Because I, And I think it will really help you if you follow along with your notes, uh, bulletin notes today. All right, Luke 3 starts by establishing a timeline here. Historians say that the time period when Tiberius and, and Herod and these others were, were ruling was approximately 27 AD, which is when Jesus and John begin their ministries. And then in 30 AD, Jesus goes to the cross. Verse 3 says, he went into all the hill country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we'll get back to that. But here in verse 4, Luke wanted us to know that John was the man Isaiah prophesied about 600 years earlier who would be a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And he quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 5, of this very point in time when the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. So that means John the Baptist could only have be a partial fulfillment of that prophecy because that didn't happen fully in his ministry. I mean, we know it didn't happen. Now, all the earth didn't, you know, see the glory of God and hear this together. So this is actually a reference to Jesus' second coming when all nations and people everywhere will see him in all his glory and when he returns as conquering king of kings and lord of lords of the whole planet. Only the last generation will see the fulfillment of this prophecy when God will raise up voices in the wilderness once more telling people to repent and to get their lives ready to meet the coming king. And I, I believe we're entering that period. I really do. I believe we're going to see uh, prophetic voices like that around the world, around the globe. It's already beginning. Isaiah goes on to describe Jesus' new covenant ministry. He said, every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground made level, the rugged places plain. In Isaiah's day, before a king took a trip, messengers would go out into all the surrounding areas that he was planning to go to and, and visit and, and tell them, prepare the roads. You know, the king has come. Get the roads ready. In the prophecy uh, that we, we're reading here, valleys represent the low areas in our lives where we're deficient in the grace of God, where we're not drawing on the mercy and strength that God's made available to us. He's talking about things like addictions to pornography and food and alcohol and entertainment. You name it. It's help is coming to pull us out of the darkness, to get us up to speed. Mountains are, are the out of balance high places where we, we exalt self out of pride and bitterness and envy. He's talking about emotions and behaviors that don't glorify God, that draw attention to us. The Holy Spirit's saying, through Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you get wrong ways right. I'm going to smooth out those rough edges in your life. I'm going to bring down all that pride and garbage. Now, John's ministry was characterized as a baptism of repentance. That's really what, what he was all about. He was saying, get right with God now so that when he appears, you'll be ready for him. You'll receive him. You won't run from him like Adam and Eve did after they sinned in the garden. Look at verse, uh, Luke 3, verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized, you brood of vipers. I mean, this guy is fearless. These are the leaders he's talking to. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. Don't just get dunked in water if you haven't truly repented. You got to drastically change what you value, how you behave. This is not just some symbolic thing you're doing out here. I mean, we're, we're preparing our hearts for something that is going to be amazing. And then he says, and don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. He's our grandpa. You know, we got blood ties. We're good. John says, no, no. Religious heritage is not a substitute for a real relationship with the Messiah. Because today people say, well, I got the, you know, I grew up in church. I got the God box check, Brian. John's saying, you don't inherit faith. You got to get your own relationship with God firsthand. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be vibrant. It's got to be real. Next statement is really going to curl our hair. Verse 9, John says, 
The axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit of repentance will be cut down and thrown into the fire. He's definitely got their attention now. I mean, this is a hell fire and brimstone kind of message that he was preaching. Verse 10, the people says, what should we do then? What does this fruit of repentance look like, John? And this is telling because what he, we're going to see here is that every answer John gives them is related to economics. It's all about how they handle money and stuff, not pride or sexual sin, although those things are, you know, really important. This was about money. This was about their money. We looked at this in, in the uh, Blessed Life series recently. It's the act of surrendering leadership of our finances that opens the deep places in our hearts to God. I mean, it just, Jesus said, you can't love God and money at the same time. It, it's like John saying, if you will obey the Lord with your money, you will quickly see issues in your heart begin to surface, both good and bad. That's how you get your spiritual life on track. You get yourself ready for this man who's coming to rule by getting these things in place. Now, obeying the Lord with your money and God blessing your life are directly connected. In all the years of pastoring that I've done, I've seen this again and again. When people will not obey God with their money, they get stuck spiritually. And here's something else. Money and bitterness are the two areas where most Christians think they're doing a whole lot better than they actually are. We deceive ourselves big time in those areas. In verse 11, John answers the what do I do question. He said, anybody who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Now, this is a hard one for we Americans to, to, to even relate to. Can, can you imagine having two shirts? I mean, I'll bet you don't even know how many shirts you've got hanging in your closet. I don't. I, I got shirts in multiple sizes now, you know. We live. It's ridiculous. You know, I can't even get into a shirt, you know, to see what it is. It's so crammed in there. We live with so much abundance. Do you know Americans throw out 50% of our produce every year? That's a... That, that's more than any nation on earth. It comes to a whopping 60 million tons or $160 billion worth of food that goes directly to landfill. Because when you walk in, Snooks or Deerbergs, don't you ever wonder, I know this all doesn't get bought. What happens to it? Landfill. So John is looking at a group of people on the other end who are praying for daily bread because they often went without it. So... This statement is loaded with personal meaning for them. But the idea is the same. It's, it's have we given the Lord control of our lives? That's the point, especially the things that we hold dear, our stuff, our money. Do we still call the shots or does he call the shots? Now, it's the tax collectors who want to know, what, what, what should we do? Uh, they're kind of the first century version of the IRS, but this would apply to anybody who's in a position to determine, you know, what people owe. So verse 13, John says, simple, don't collect any more than you're required to. Don't cheat people. You know, just because you can, don't do it. Be honest. And then he addresses the soldiers, and this is to anybody in a position of authority who can bully people to get money out of. And this was a big deal, because soldiers didn't make much, and nobody could stop them from extorting people and taking bribes. Verse 14, John says, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Don't abuse your power to get a little more. And here's the fruit of repentance. He said, be content with your pay. John spoke with such boldness, with such authority. Verse 15 says, the people were, were all wondering if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John, I'm sure he sees it on their faces, answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandal I, sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now that's a whole new ball game. It's very interesting that Jesus, I, I found this interesting when I was in college, I, you know, we were studying through the Gospels and I, there were things that I had never put together and this was, a, this was one. It's interesting, Jesus and his disciples also preached the same, the, the, a similar message of repentance and his disciples baptized people in water like John. But what Jesus did on the cross 
takes water baptism in a whole new direction. His resurrection from, uh, from death means that we can now be changed from the inside out. So here's what happens after Jesus' resurrection. Here's what happens with this whole thing of water baptism. He tells his disciples in Mark 16, 15, he's risen from the dead. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is very different than what John was doing in the wilderness. It's a very different baptism, and here's how we know that, all right? Here's how we know that from Scripture. In Acts 19, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, he asked them? No, they replied. We haven't, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. They replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for a repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, Look at this. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, they had been baptized in John's baptism, but this is totally different. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. They, there were about 12 men in all. Okay, so now that Jesus is risen, we're under a new covenant. John was preparing people for Jesus' first coming. Now that the Holy Spirit's on the scene, he does the work of convincing people of their sin and need for God. We work in partnership with him. And this convincing is way more than us just recognizing we mess up occasionally. I mean, he helps us understand sinfulness is literally rooted in the core of our being. It goes all the way down to the bottom of who we are. So it's God himself who now initiates true repentance. Because he's the one. This is why prayer is so important when you're praying for unchurched people. Because we, we, the Holy Spirit is, in partner, is working in partnership with us. He said, keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. Keep asking me to break down the barriers that are keeping people blinded spiritually. In John uh, 644, or 644, Jesus said, nobody can turn to me, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws them. So... It's a work of the Holy Spirit start to finish, and we play a role in that by cooperating. And repentance is more than saying, you know, i got to stop doing bad stuff. It's, it's surrender. It's total surrender. It's saying, I need Jesus to save me from the sin that is at work in the core of who I am. And that's when the Holy Spirit breathes eternal life into our dead spirits, and we come alive spiritually and are united with Christ. It's supernatural. Our spirits are literally born again. That's what Jesus said happens inside us. You have to be born again spiritually. Our whole perspective on life changes. To repent is to see life through God's eyes, which could only happen after Jesus rose from the dead as the firstborn of the new creation. So can you see how this significantly changes the meaning of water baptism? Because if you just think of water baptism as John the Baptist, baptism is a whole different deal. When John was baptizing, it signified cleansing, preparing for Jesus' coming. Today we go down to the water signifying that we're burying an old way of life. We're burying our lives. We're, we died with Christ. And our sins have been washed away. We come up out of the water to a new resurrected life in Christ. And when the devil comes and says, you are still a sinner, you say, that guy is buried. This is a new creature you're talking to. Baptism is saying, I've been wrong about everything. I've totally missed the goalpost. I didn't even know what the game was about. Now I see it's all about Jesus. It's all about this eternal partnership that we're going to have with him and me surrendering everything to him. Apostle Paul gets into this in his uh, letter to the Romans where he describes baptism as an act of relinquishing control. It's where we separate ourselves from our old, dead, corrupt self by burying it in the waters of baptism. And, and, and it's the rest of our Christian life, that is the reckoning point. That is the place where you say, that guy is dead and buried. I am a new person. Here it is. 
This is Romans 6, 3. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Read it with me now. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We get a whole new identity. In fact, Paul goes into this a little more in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You come up from the water saying, from now on, this is a different person. This is a new, I'm under new management. I embrace God's ways, and by his grace, I will live under Jesus' leadership and values. I am a new creation. I, old things have passed away and b- been buried. For so many people, baptism is just a ceremony. It's something they do outwardly, but nothing really changes inside. It's like wearing a wed- wedding ring and not being married. I mean, what good is that going to do you? The, it, baptism without the relationship is symbol without reality. The Bible calls baptism the seal of our salvation. And I know what I'm about to read here is going to sound a little strange to our Western ears, but I think this will help connect, con- connect the dots a bit. In Romans 4, 11, Paul says, Abraham... He's talking to believers here. He said, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. He's talking to everybody who believes in Jesus who's not a Jew, which is most of us. That righteousness might be imputed to them also. Paul says, Abraham had faith and was right with God before he was circumcised. So why then did he get circumcised? Paul says it was given to him as a sign or a seal of his being made right with God by faith. And by seal, Paul's referring to something they used back in the first century, you know, to authenticate a document. They would press this, you know, unique identifying mark into hot wax or moist clay and it would seal the, the, the document. Obviously, the seal didn't add to the content of the document. I mean, it, it marked it as the property of the owner, sealing what was inside it. Another example is, you know, a wedding ring, which I mentioned. It's, it's, it's not essential. In fact, Wes kept losing his. I think he got a tattoo. <laughs> but, but it's not essential. I mean, you can, you can be legally married without it, But that ring is considered a seal of the marriage covenant. I can look at this ring, you know, and know that a promise of love and devotion was made by me and to me. There's a woman in my life who has clearly promised to love me in sickness and in health, in broken ribs, till death do us part. (laughs) And I made that same promise to her, the commitment is locked in place. I'm hers, she's mine for life. And it's only in that context that true love can thrive. And young people, look at me. You're not going to find it until you lock into that. If you think that you're ever going to find true intimacy in just a live-in arrangement, it's not going to work. You, God made marriage a sacred bond. And it's in that bond, in that commitment, in that covenant that you're gonna find true intimacy and fulfillment. Now, again, that's what the ring signifies. I mean, the commitment's locked in place. I'm, I'm hers and she's mine for life. Now, the promise is still there if I take it off. I mean, she's already got my love without it and I got her a license promising she's not going anywhere. I mean, it's official. The marriage, meal, uh, marriage deal is done. There's nothing to add to it by a ring to make it more complete. And yet in a special way, this ring conveys that our love for one another is real. A big room full of witnesses. 39 years ago, I vowed my complete and unconditional faithfulness to Debbie. I was putting all my faith in our future together. In a similar way, it's faith that enables me to unplug from everyone and everything else to put all of who I am into my future with Christ. 
That's baptism. It's a sign and a seal of the grace that made my death and the death of Christ reality. So baptism portrays our death in a very tangible way. It portrays our death, burial, and resurrection, I should say, in a tangible way. That's what the sacraments do. Baptism and communion give us physical touch points for our faith. They're interactive events that allow us to experience God's presence. On the first Wednesday of every month, we did that this week. We hold a wafer and a cup of juice and remember Christ's body was broken and his blood was spilled because God's wrath came down on him in our place. Jesus absorbed our sins on the cross, taking our guilt. It brings the reality of his sacrifice front and center. And once more, we're made to realize the magnitude of what has happened to us in Christ. Now, just for the sake of clarity, we practice believer baptism here, which makes this an adult decision. We, we dedicate infants. I, I, I know this is you know, confusing for those of you who came from a, another background. We dedicate infants. We believe in that. That's a big deal here. And for baptism and communion, we have a program here called Jumpstart, much like uh, catechism that some of you grew up with. It is excellent. Parents, there's a flyer that explains it all out there in the info tables. You really need to take advantage of this. Uh, you want your kids to understand this. You want them to be uh, uh, accountable at the age of accountability before they, you know, are baptized, before they take communion. If you were baptized as an infant, I mean, that's all well and good, but Jesus' command was to believe and be baptized. You can't do that as an infant. So you need to redo that as a believer. Now that you're a believer in Christ, now that you believe, you act that out in death, burial, and resurrection. The, the Greek word for baptize is actually the word baptismo, which means to immerse in water, which is why we practice immersion and, uh, and you're identifying with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's, that's the, the idea. It's a visual. Now, we do acknowledge the historical practice of sprinkling in special cases. And so, you know, we got you covered. Uh, if you're, you know, deadly afraid of the water or whatever, you know, we'll help you. Uh, uh, we, in fact, we are going to be baptizing down at the baptismal fount immediately after. Not immediately. We'll give you time to get down there. Uh, but after the service is over, I, man, I had somebody come up here and said, I'm going to take a dunk in the pool today. You've convinced me. I'm going. This is the time to do it. I mean, to stop putting this off. One last thing. Okay, so Luke 3.21 says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now, Jesus was always fully God, but when he became a man, he experienced all the limitations of humanity, and he chose to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to do anything that he did supernaturally. That was the only way he could fully represent us and represent the human race. So he had to be tempted in every way we are and depend on the Holy Spirit the same way we do and had to communicate with God through prayer the same way we do it. And that's why the Holy Spirit came on him when he was baptized. But that's not all. The Father spoke audibly over him. Verse 22, God said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, I just, I, just, I love this. He didn't say, all right, this is the guy. You know, here he is. This is the Messiah. Follow him. He didn't talk to the crowd about Jesus. He talked to Jesus about Jesus. The crowd just witnessed it. The Gospels tell us very little about Jesus after the Christmas story. It's 30 years later. He's 30 years old now. And in this one sentence, in those words of the Father, I am well pleased with you, we see what Jesus was like as a teenager and young adult. In the weeks and months that followed for three long years, Jesus drew life and identity from those words. When people hated his preaching and tried to kill him, when his friends rejected him, his mother's heart was broken. Jesus got confidence and comfort knowing that the Father delighted in his obedience. He's our example in everything. He followed the, the same path that we're talking about here. If you haven't followed his example and you haven't been baptized, it's time to fix that. I mean, think about it. Jesus dies an excruciating death for our sins, freeing us 
from all our guilt and shame. He hangs on a cross naked in public. How can we say, I want you to take my sins. I want you to be my savior. I just don't want to go public. I just, you know, it's like saying, I want to be married. I'm just not wearing a ring. I, I want people to know. There's something wrong with that. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark 8, 38. If a person is ashamed of me and my message in this, these adulterous and sinful days, I will be ashamed of that person when I return in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. So you might want to rethink that. Now, this is not a legalistic thing. This is not planning to get baptized and getting struck by lightning and dying before you do and God sending you to hell because you didn't get dumped. That's not what we're talking about here. Thief on the cross wasn't baptized, and yet Jesus said, I'm going to meet you in paradise before the day is done. When you have a genuine heart change, I mean, you're just, your immediate attitude is one of obedience. And that's the issue here. You're, you're saying, God, God, yeah, lead me to the water. I'm ready. I, I, I'll tell you what it confuses you sometimes when you read the New Testament. They didn't separate baptism from conversion. If a person wanted to be converted, they were looking for a, you know, a tub or something in the middle of the night. They just took people to the water. We were a bunch of kids uh, back in the 70s. God was doing stuff. I, that's all I can explain. I mean, uh, we had a Saturday night meeting that just grew exponentially, and uh, we'd come and sing in the spirit for an hour before the meeting, and then we get into that meeting, and I mean, we watched God deliver people of drug addiction, every kind of thing imaginable, on the spot, no withdrawals a lot of times. It was just miraculous kind of intervention, heroin, all this kind of stuff, and so... Uh, <laughs> So it became just kind of the thing that if you led somebody to the Lord, you got in your car with them and you came over to the shed where we dunked them in the tub. I mean, we just, we did it that way. We just followed that way. And what we found is that there's a tremendous power in doing it that way. It's one of the reasons we built a fountain out there so that people can just, you know, in community, small groups and in and, and, and community, people can come even at other times and just say, hey, you know, my friend here has just come, come to Christ. She wants to be baptized. Well, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, let's identify. Let's, let's fully identify with Jesus and his death, his burial and resurrection, and then let's lay hands on you and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you. And over and over and over again, we watch God just do this miracle of, of life change. I want to, I have a hunger for that again. Do you? I want to see that. I want to see life change. I don't want to see people, you know, three years later still struggling with all the same stuff. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit at work. And I think this is one of those things we got to get right. So if you haven't been baptized today, just, you know, we got uniforms out there. We've even got hair dryers. You can leave with dry hair, all right? So, so uh, you know, it's really not an excuse if you haven't done this to just say, all right, I'm going to get it done. 